So I'm pleased to welcome our third and uh, final uh, Grand Challenge team to the stage this evening. Uh, their uh, Grand Challenge is entitled Living Fluids, Understanding Collective Behaviour for Bio-Inspired Engineering. And on behalf of the executive leadership team, the presenters are Ulrike Matisses from the Research School of Biology and Michael Schatz from the Research School of Physics and Engineering. Thank you, Margaret. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Schatz, I'm a physicist, and I'll start this presentation on behalf of our Grand Challenge team on living fluids. And we'll be talking about living fluids, collective behavior, and bio-inspired engineering. So perhaps I should start defining what are we talking about? What are living fluids? Uh, normally by living fluids we call uh, fluids which are essential for life, such as blood. Uh, but recently, in recent times, uh, we also have another meaning to this word. We are talking about uh, systems made of large uh, groups of uh, active and interacting elements. And there are numerous examples around us, uh, like uh, the flocks of birds, uh, swarms of insects, swarms of fish. Uh, sometimes we talk about spreading opinions in the society. That's also a little fluid. We have many interacting elements in that system. Stock markets, material flows. You take a glass of water, there are microorganisms in there. We, in our physics laboratory, we performed experiments with uh, water. I'm doing physics of fluids. If we take distilled water, we have one result. It has water from Lake Burley Griffin. It's a completely different substance. We cannot use the same equations of hydrodynamics to describe its behavior because it's obviously populated by organic matter and by living organisms. So it's just a matter of the concentration of these microorganisms, active elements within the fluid, to completely change properties of, that, of such a fluid. As physicists, we say that any living fluid, in that sense, is a system strongly out of equilibrium. What does it mean? It means that uh, uh, systems at thermal equilibrium uh, described by certain laws, for example, second law of thermodynamics, which is not strictly speaking applicable to living fluids. So we have to study these new systems again. And uh, perhaps uh, this is the reason why this new field of living fluids is emerging as we speak. Uh, for any uh, research field uh, to form, we need three basic elements. We need concepts and methodologies. We need object of studies and we need tools. Object of studies are already mentioned, but we have to have something which we can handle, something uh, which we can use in our laboratories and do reproducible thousands of experiments, repeat again and again, going back to our theoretical models, check results in the experiments, and then we understand this object better, and then we can apply our conclusions to other systems. Uh, for this reason, uh, the object has been spelled recently uh, as a bacterium. Believe it or not, we live in the era of bacterial revolution. And why bacteria? For the problem of living fluids, this is intrinsically a scientific problem, which is a multi-scale problem. We have to deal with a large range of scales from the size of the element, to at least 1,000 times bigger, better 10,000, better even more. If we're dealing with bacteria, typical size of one to two microns, we, in a drop of bacterial suspension, we're dealing with 10,000 elements. That gives us some reliable statistics. We can do this with birds, I'm not talking about humans or financial markets, that's dangerous to experiment with. Tools, that's another great thing we need to have to, to form the field and the recent progress in the microscopy, in computer simulations, and of course in genetic engineering, microbiology, gave us tools which we, which we couldn't dream uh, about before, 10 years ago. So it's not coincidental that right now this field is emerging. Why bacteria? Independently of our requests for the large statistics, bacteria is emerging as a central topic in many areas again, once again, in the history of science because they are active, they are able of many things which we never thought about. And what is interesting, uh, the bacteria, there are plenty of, plenty of bacteria around us. On the human body, there are 39 trillion bacterial cells and only 30 trillion human cells. So we as humans are actually more <laughs> bacteria than, than humans in that sense. So we have to take them seriously, but what is, it's yeah, they're small, but they make it by numbers. 
we have to treat them with the respect they deserve. And also, bacteria is a resource. It's a resource of energy, it's a resource of materials, it's a resource of new ideas. And why? We're talking about living fluids and bacteria. Because living fluids, by definition, uh, the properties of living fluids cannot be predicted, they cannot be understood from the properties of the elements which constitute the fluid. We have to understand them as a group. And that's what we are. We cannot understand many things. You can see this bacteria. This is a drop of bacteria uh, rotating coherently together. And that's an example of collective motion. I will get back to this video. Collective memory. Each individual microorganism doesn't have much memory. Their brain is features. But collectively, they have memory, and they remember what happened to them. Uh, collective decision making. Bacteria possess amazing properties. They launch, for example, virulent attack only if they have numbers to win. And they tell each other about the numbers. How do they know about this? They communicate within the group. And this mechanism and the system uh, Yuli is going to talk about is called quorum sensing. That's a very important, that's a hot topic these days. We need to understand how, viral, uh, how they attack, because they, sometimes they resist antibiotics, and we don't want that. But they can do many interesting things. We're talking about collective intelligence, and we all think that intelligence has to do with brains. Many scientists these days don't think so. These brainless animals in large groups, they show signatures of collective intelligence. And this is something that we can learn. We, we can learn other systems from studying bacteria, not because we're just interested in bacteria. So what is this challenge about? This challenge is about understanding operational principles of living fluids for the development of new technologies, materials, and environment. Because living fluids are us, inside and outside. Why? What for? There is another growing field which is clearly a field of the 21st century. It's called bioinspired engineering. Bioinspired engineering, as name suggests, uh, uh, applies knowledge learned from the biosystems to engineering, to applications in society, uh, in the technologies. And uh, there are many areas in bioinspired engineering. Uh, one of them is uh, biomimicry, like the illustration here. This robotic arm really was inspired by the elephant trunk. Uh, but there are other things like uh, non self-organization for non-assembling non-materials, uh, uh, self-organization, as I mentioned. Several of these areas are part of the uh, research proposal on living fluids we're talking about today. This field is growing. This field started just recently. It started maybe a few years ago. This background dates back, I don't know, 16th century, Levin Hook's discovery of the first bacteria with his microscope. It's flat, now it started growing. Centers for bioinspired engineering, collective behavior, living fluids start emerging. We have a WIS Institute at Harvard University uh, five years ago, Okinawa uh, Institute for Science and Technology, a large uh, multidisciplinary institute, bioinspired materials uh, coordinated by NASA in the US. Uh, in Ulich, we have a research center, Fortune Center, which supports several large programs related to this proposal. So, this is a really active research area which we want to be part of. Why here at the ANU? The answer is quite simple. We have a very unique combination here on the campus to make this happen. We have expertise in medical research, we have expertise in plant biology, genetics, data visualization, message, this is full of arts by the way, uh, physics of fluids, imaging and optics, nanofabrication. To make this happen, we don't need to go anywhere. We can do everything on the campus. We already started collaborations. The Grand Challenge will greatly help to enhance this collaboration and move forward. Okay, let's get back to science. Self-organization is a fascinating object. And every time we see a flock of birds or swarm of uh, ants like shown here, we don't often see that on the divers, perhaps. Uh, but they do self-organize, and they self-organize quite similarly, quite often. And it, it's very important to understand what is the mechanism behind, what drives them to do this circular motion, for example. I get back to this material flow in the, in the drop of material suspension. Uh, you see it starts as a fairly disordered motion, but very soon they, they coordinate their motion, and it's a one large vortex. 
as a physicist, when I see this vortex, and actually that's a fascinating one, I first read it, but I couldn't believe my eyes in, in, in Nature publication two years ago. When this motion starts, this liquid, this living fluid, drops its viscosity by a factor of 10, okay? This is superfluid, what we physicists call superfluid, which is uh, a fact which is observed at ultra-low temperatures, close to the absolute zero. And this is at the room temperature. First question we ask, can we do this without living fluids? Can we replace these little microorganisms with artificial particles? And that's what we're working on now. And why we're confident we can do it? Because we were studying turbulence, and turbulence is strongly dissolved flow. This is an example of that. And you can see, as if we wait a little bit, we see that this disorder and this chaos turns into the ordered motion. What is special about this ordered motion? It's the highest energy state. It's a one vortex. The dissipation is the lowest that can, you can get. We are thinking about applying this method of converting chaos into order to energy extraction, not, not just in bacterial flows, that's one of the projects, but the other one on the large scale for the power extraction from, say, uh, coastal, uh, uh, coastal surface waves. I'll pass it on because physicists are excited, but biologists have even better ideas what we can do with bacteria and our understanding of collective behavior. Please, you. Thank you, Michael. Um, my name is Ulrike Matesius. I'm from the Research School of Biology, and I'm a plant scientist. But I'm actually interested in the same kind of problems that Michael just talked about in physics. So this is a plant. This is a wheat plant, and it's just been pulled up from the soil. You just see some roots covered in a bit of dirt, right? Not very significant, you might say. But this little bit of dirt around the root is actually what underpins much of our crop production. And if you look closely, you can see that the plant, just as us, is really made up not just of the plant, but of lots and lots of microbes, lots and lots of bacteria that are sticking to the cells of the plant. And just like the microbiome in us, the plant microbiome is responsible for a lot of functions that the plant need to survive in their environment. And these ones are not just random bacteria that are um, um, occupying the surface of the root. They're very selective bacteria. The plant has selected these bacteria to come to the surface and provide certain functions for them. And I'll give you one example for how important this can be. This is a symbiosis we, we study in the lab. This is a root system of a legume, like a pea or a bean or a lentil that you might be eating. If you look at the roots, they've got these little nodules attached to them. And if you look inside those nodules, they're inhabited by bacteria, by very specific bacteria. And in this case, these bacteria carry out a very specific function. They convert atmospheric nitrogen that we breathe in and out all the time into a form that living organisms can use, ammonia, here. This reaction underpins all the nitrogen input into biological systems. Half the nitrogen that is in your body is derived from this reaction by these bacteria inside nodules that have entered the food chain. The other half of the nitrogen in your body comes from synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that the farmers are throwing on the fields. That's about 100 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer. Most of them get washed out into waterways that pollute the Great Barrier Reef, for example. So really, we want all of that nitrogen to come from biological nitrogen fixation. The problem is that very few plants can form this interaction and make use of these bacteria. Most crop plants that we eat can't do that, and that's why we need fertilizer. To demonstrate that, here's a soybean plant that can interact with nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and here's the same one that has a very small mutation that stops it from making that interaction. So you can see that effect of these bacteria for the plant in the absence of nitrogen fertilizer. But it's not easy to um, engineer um, functional symbioses of plants with bacteria. Various things have to happen. The first thing is that a plant that is surrounded by random selections of bacteria first actually orchestrates the bacterial behavior in the soil. It actively makes bacteria move towards the roots and it also selects these bacteria. The next thing that has to happen is that the bacteria have to organize themselves to become useful. The bacteria are not just randomly bumbling about in the soil, they talk to each other via quorum sensing that Michael already mentioned. They can coordinate their behavior, they can coordinate their movement, they can coordinate infection of the plant, 
They can all coordinate behaviors that are essential for nitrogen fixation and other functions. And if this doesn't happen, the bacteria are not useful for the plant and not useful for us. But one thing that has always been missing out of this equation is that we've always looked at these systems under very ideal conditions. If you look at a real root growing in a real soil in Australia, um, and if you look at, if you think about uh, the reality of soil fluid dynamics, which obviously influences the motility and behavior of bacteria, you can see that this soil doesn't have very much fluid much of the time. And then the next day it rains and suddenly you've got too much. So we can't really currently predict the coordinated behavior of bacteria in a lot of environments with very fluctuating and extreme conditions. So what can we do? For example, one example of applications would be to extend nitrogen fixing symbiosis to plants that can't form them. So we have to understand a very complex problem and that is how does bacterial behavior um, how is that coordinated by plant signals and by fluid dynamics, the physics of the soil and the water? We can influence that, hopefully, by engineering chemical signals that can influence the behavior of the bacteria. And one aspect of that is targeted manipulation of signals and targeted movement of signals into the soil by small vehicles that can move, micro vehicles that can move in the soil and selectively change the fluid around, around roots into superfluids. And with that, I hand back to Michael. Thank you, Emily. That's a fascinating idea. When we first heard about it, we thought, OK, micro vehicles. Can we help with these micro vehicles? Because we need to deliver this uh, chemical signal from here. And then the, we started thinking, yes, we are working on more or less the same phenomena. We were studying uh, how little particles move in the disordered material or disordered flow internals, for example. And uh, you can see on the first graph, this is just a circular particle, a disk right here. And as you might expect, it behaves exactly like Brownian particle would. It executes random walk. It doesn't have any derivativity in it. We watch it for a long time and nothing happens. But then when we started the underlying fabric of the flow, which drives this motion, we figured out that we can design this particle and we can shape the particle to make it move along, not exactly the straight line, but something close to it. It's no longer Brownian walk, it's, it's, it's a directed motion. These days, fabricating these little micro vehicles is not a problem. With nanofabrication, microfabrication developed in the state, we can make them in big numbers in no time. So, after we heard about the idea from Uli about using this for the plant biology, we are now seriously working on this project. So this is just one example of the ideas which are emerging as a result of our cross-college uh, discussions in the preparation for this grand challenge. So building bridges is an important thing, especially in this university, and it will probably bring more fruits. But I'm not saying that we understood everything about self-organization and we have nothing else to do, just what we thought so. One of my colleagues discovered in the lab another example of self-organization, and we have sleepless night. I hope you will have too. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Could I invite the team also to come to the front of the stadium? And can I now open the floor for questions? Come on, there must be one question, some question. Thank you, there's one there. Thanks, that was, that was a really fascinating talk. I'm, I'm Deborah, and I, again, I declare my conflict of interest as being part of team number two. Uh, I'm genuinely fascinated in social organising systems, and I've actually used some nonlinear dynamical analysis in my own um, research. So what, my question is, uh, self-organising systems, are, as I'm sure you you're well aware, are driven by um, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So they can be hard to predict, like the weather. So, so how do you deal mathematically with those kinds of concepts? I'm sure you have a fantastic answer for that. So <laughs> Yes, uh, initial conditions are only important if we 
interested in the deterministic trajectory. Okay? Yeah. We're talking statistics here. Yeah. That's why we need tens of thousands of trajectories, mm -hmm. and we watch them, we repeat experiments many, many times, and we don't care about initial conditions. What we do care about are the boundary conditions. That's very important. Because boundary conditions determine how this little creatures will self-organize. If the mean free path, if they can, if their memory is long enough to go without turning right or left and reach the boundary, the boundary will guide them. And that's a very important part of this equation with the self-organization. And actually the vehicle I showed you relies on exactly that principle. We ex exploit their finite memory and long correlation time of the flow underneath the raft. I probably start talking without the microphone. Um, I have a question about the outputs of the uh, of the field of research that you're proposing. Obviously, with looking at nitrogen fixation, you could be looking at um, uh, food security kinds of outputs. Do you have any other kinds of outputs that you might like to talk about? <laughs> of this project will be that like we you all see this fascinating circularization of the of, of the uh, new fluids and if you supposing that you put a turbine in that you may be able to generate some kind of uh, uh, bacterial wind farm and uh, this will give you uh, possible power uh, power for micro pumps which you can pr process we control the how, how much volumes for, uh, the volumes of micro fluids fluid you want to inject into like for any of those health applications and you may want to uh, pump out some big fluids out of, out of the body and or pumping some medic medicals uh, medicines that's one of the uh, possible uh, outcomes that we're looking at so I'll just cover a little bit on the application. So I'm an engineer, but I look a lot at blood. And my focus here is to look at how the reactive agents of blood. So we all know blood is everywhere, um, but the most reactive agents in blood is platelets. You can actually trigger them um, uh, in a way that it can be a drug delivery engine. They could be a way to seal up the wound in a much efficient fashion. So by working with Gata and, and the team, we'll be able to understand how platelets are uh, organized within the body. Mm -hmm. right. May I add just one more to, to your question, mm -hmm. one quick answer. Uh, uh, micro pumps, this flow about me. You can put a turbine and it will pump fluid. Sometimes we think it's what, what this little bacteria can do for us, but in medical applications, we need sometimes nanoliters a minute or microliters an hour. We don't need much flow, but we need precision. And only micro pumps and micro motors can do this. And this is a good potential candidate for developing these micro motors and micro pumps. Mm -hmm. Hello, Igor Stratton from Romania. What you presented, thank you, is really fascinating science. My question is probably no doubt the similar research is conducted in leading industrial laboratories, right? Because it's clearly great potential, potentially great commercial outcome. How you structure your work with industrial laboratories and is there any competition? What's your role? What's your relative position in potential competition in this area? Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, WISE Institute came up five years ago. Uh, I was there when they started. Um, they looked at bio-inspired engineering from a very broad sense. I think from our group, we look at specifically on collective behavior and how collective behavior transcends itself from the physical principle to the engineering uh, devices we can make to the translation. So that's how we are different and that's how we think we'll be better. Mm -hmm. Any final questions? I'm conscious of the time, we are a little over. If not, please join with me in thanking all the questions. <laughs>